welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much. Now let's start with the situation as regards COVID because there are currently 11,000 active cases reported in your country. There have been 1,500 deaths, but that will be underreported. What's your assessment of the situation at the moment? You know, it is possible that it is underreported, but we go by what we have officially. And if you look at the figures, this third wave has pushed us to that level because even positivity rate had come back down to almost 0.5 percent. And now that rate has gone all the way up to 26, 25 percent. And there are some specific places where uh, more positive cases have been indicated, like the Blantyre City. Now, one has to understand that for a country like ours, and for all that we are doing, in order that we might respond to this pandemic, the figures you mentioned, you could see that in some places, it is at one day's figure uh, in terms of people dying. We want to value every life, and that is why we have also embarked on uh, not just testing and not just uh, hospitalizing people and making sure we give them whatever is necessary for them to get well, because the recovery rates have been over 85 percent. But we want to make sure that people get the vaccine uh, whenever sure. that is possible. And we'll come on to vaccines in a minute, but you mentioned Blantyre, and when Malawi, Liverpool and the Wellcome Trust did a study last year, they found antibody levels of about 12%. That was last year. So it does suggest the actual infection rates in the country are so much higher than is being reported. Do you, do you accept that that probably is the case? It's just testing, no. the ability to test that is limiting the picture that you know. When you are doing a scientific study, you go with figures, not probabilities. And these are the testing sites we have across the country and the results that we've had to work mm. with. But more testing, if you were capable of testing more, you'd find more. Obviously, and there are more testing that, uh, right. uh, sites that are being set up in order for us to have that. Well, let's look at the hospitals, because you said earlier this year our medical facilities are terribly understaffed, our medical personnel are out, un outnumbered. The effect of the pandemic has had a really profound uh, effect on the whole of the health system, hasn't it? What we are doing right now is to make sure that we have more people employed, more service and caregivers employed, and get the hospitals and uh, centers that uh, provide services uh, equipped well. In fact, we just passed a budget in which all of the district hospitals will be looked at and renovated and equipped. So this is a response to something that has already been there and far for far too right. long and okay, attended But to. I want to ask you about, it, it, it's already under pressure, the health system, and then you have COVID yes. comes along, which is why uh, Yoon Hong of the United Nations Population Fund said, uh, the pandemic, the effect of it was on the availability of manpower. It also exerted pressure on the entire health system, including stock of certain medicines, equipment, basic medical supplies. So I'm wondering, if this third wave continues, can the hospitals cope? Can you tell me which country has not under, been under pressure because of COVID? This is a worldwide pandemic, and Malawi is doing all it can within the resources that it has Thank God that we're able to speak these figures right now and these deaths right now, but every person's life is valuable and we want to continue to do with what we have in order to save more lives. Right. Now, you brought up vaccines because, as you say, that's the way out of it. Only 0.2 per cent out of the country's population of 18 million is fully vaccinated. Uh, Two per cent have had one dose. Why is it so low? Where do you lay the blame for that? I don't blame anyone else. What we are saying is, let the vaccines be more readily accessible uh, from the north to the south. We cannot afford 
to have people die or even get infected while others are being inoculated with high percentages. In Africa, less than 1%. You mentioned Malawi, 0.2%. We want more and uh, able to save as many lives as possible. Okay, well, you're here in the UK, which is one of the most highly vaccinated countries in the world. There's almost 56% of the total population, that's the total population, not just adults, fully right. vaccinated. 70% has at least one jab. Does it seem fair to you? Well, you asked that question, but you can have the answer to that question. This is the unfairness that is there, the great divide that is there. And we are grateful that UK is able to do what you just described. But how many countries can you talk in that fashion in Africa, in Latin America, in Southeast Asia? But what I'm wondering is because you said we are at the mercy of the international community. So I wonder, do you come to a country like the UK and think that they are being merciful or merciless? May I just speak as it is. If we were able to produce our own uh, vaccines, if we were able uh, to do stuff, you know, in a global village where everyone is dependent on everyone else, using that word does not mean that somebody is merciless. It just means that we need to have equitable distribution, we need to have access, you cannot wait until UK vaccinates all of its population and then you say, well, then uh, the vaccines can be made available to other countries. When nobody is safe, nobody will be safe. But the UK is doing that. So I wonder what you're saying or plan on saying to your hosts while you're here. Well, we are grateful for, for example, we have AstraZeneca uh, vaccines that we began to distribute. And uh, just three days ago, we had another lot come into the country. And so we are thankful for what we can use. But it's tiny. I mean, the numbers are tiny relative to the need. For those who get help, it's never too late. We will make sure that we have help when it's needed. Okay. And it is needed well, now. It is needed now. So right. when, when on the current schedule do you expect the population of Malawi to be vaccinated such that you have the virus under control? We are trusting that uh, with the 1.3 million doses expected in the next couple of uh, months, uh, in total, uh, uh, based on what has been uh, 1.3 million in two to months. Us, yes. So you right. We hope that we can continue to roll out this. Um, uh, a program and then get more vaccines. Now we have just passed uh, a resolution to uh, not just work with one vaccine, but with several. And so we trust that we can have uh, several vaccines made available. Have you asked? the UK, your hosts here, to, to give up some of their spare capacity? I'm going to ask them because I have a meeting with them. And, and we, have, we have done so in the past and they have helped. In terms of the effect it's having on Malawi, because it's not just on health, it's also on the economy. Right. GDP had to be downgraded last year. It was forecast to be nearly 5%. It was downgraded to 0.8%. It's projected to rebound 3.8%, but is that going to be, have to be downgraded further too? With the flux context we're dealing with, you may be right, but if we can have our people fed, if we can have our people face this with a little more resilience like we have always shown to be a resilient people, if we can have certain services begin to be delivered to the people, 
and the world situation changing so that we are able to move on uh, with the I industries that are being set up. We will have the economy coming back. Okay, the but, but a forecast, the forecast at the moment is for 3.8% GDP. That is, is there th any way that... Might that is the forecast from 0 0.8. What is the forecast in the UK? What you do here with very little is much because in terms of actual figures cannot be compared with Malawi. But Malawi, if it grows that much, it means that there will be help for the masses that are needing that help right now. Okay, but the reason I'm asking this is that a year ago, when you were elected, before you were elected, you promised that uh, you would create a million jobs. Now, at the time, there was, the pandemic was already underway when you made this promise. How many jobs have you created in the past year? When we started, for example, with the Affordable Inputs Program, we had thousands of jobs. Young people were employed in, across the country with millions of people accessing the affordable inputs. It, it was 3.7, actually 3.5 million people able to access inputs that put a workable Okay. Uh, it was a simple question. It was, able. It, it was a simple question. Let me you finish. promised a million jobs. Uh, let, I'm wondering let, let how me, many you've let, created. Let, let me finish. Because of other people being laid off, since industries was scaling down due to the pandemic, because we were able to create jobs for those people who would need wages, Okay, so, the you're, 600, so your 000, argument is the you're, 600, you saved jobs, you would have lost more jobs. We could have lost more jobs. The 600,000 okay. so, that lost their jobs, compared to the 300,000 that were able to be employed, that was going to be possible in an ideal situation. Okay. So what so, I'm saying to so you... So the net is what? The net is how many job losses? Job losses? It's 600... So you promised yes. a million jobs, right. and you've, the country has lost 600,000. Yes. And what we are able to do now, with all of those that have wages, earnable income, through the provision of loans, through the provision of cash transfers, through the provision of, of uh, food that they were able to grow, that was translated okay. in a population that would be working, not necessarily employed on a regular basis, but having a wage right. well, that they could live this. on. People voted you in on the back of a promise to create a million jobs. That is what? not the only promise. Okay, but that it was a significant promise, a significant pledge of your campaign. What do you say they to those people yes. who voted for you thinking that you would create jobs? The majority of Malawians, I said, 80% are smallholder farmers. And they voted on the basis that we would have affordable farm inputs, which we did provide. And Malawi an now, I wonder, and, and I Malawi wonder. now has you on record the best yield so far. And so the majority. And this, this is about the the, the majority fathers, uh, but, farmers. But let me. But 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 it, from what you're saying, you're so, saying it, it 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 was just one pledge. Did no, it not no. matter? Was it an empty pledge? No no no. It is not an empty pledge. I am saying, we will fulfil that. But how many people have lost jobs here? It's it, it's irrelevant. I'm asking you about it, Malawi. It, it, I'm it, asking you about your it, country so and promises I you made. So I want made. you to understand the context in which we are dealing with these things. When you make a promise, which I did, and then I explain to people every time, this is why we have not been able to do this. You knew and there was you, a pandemic a year ago. No, no, no. The country had declared a state of emergency. We started to say that in 2019, there was no pandemic at that time. So, and we you, did not want to go back on that because time. But your pre, so your predecessor, 
who, and you, who you won on the back of promises like this, the former president, Peter Mutarika, says of your government they're creating one million poor people instead of one million jobs. He should be the best and the first one to know what they did by destroying the economy of that country and expecting it to be resuscitated in one year. You cannot take him seriously because he is not even telling one iota of truth in what he mentioned. Apart from not creating the jobs you promised, the other effect on ordinary Malawians' life over the last year is that prices have shot up. And one of the things that where it's very, very evident is in the price of cooking oil. You introduced, reintroduced VAT in October last year, 16.5%. According to the Consumers Association of Malawi, cooking oil has gone up by 50%. And there are countless organizations asking for you to remove VAT from cooking oil. Will you? Yes, but let me give you the you context. Will. You will remove VAT from cooking oil. Let me now give you the context. When we promised that we would raise the tax ban to 100,000, we wanted people to have more disposable income. When we said that we would want minimum wage raised to 50,000, and these have been done, by the way, we wanted more, more people to have disposable income. When we said we would uh, give people loans so they can start businesses, when we said uh, I gave an order to have uh, SMEs uh, uh, be prioritized, we were wanted to respond to that. But here is the catch. What you're saying is not the whole story, and what is being told is not the whole story. But we are right now okay, but with the clear. Ministry of Trade and Industry, and then with uh, uh, people that are bringing in these things. We want, by November, okay, sitting of Parliament, to be able to look at those figures and so to tell you that after that has been dealt with, you would know that not only is the problem with cooking oil, the problem is actually how you bring in goods and services right. and how, uh, on top of everything else that is being brought into the country to make sure industries work, there is a deliberate, deliberate effort not to make things like those work. ندعو إلى مستشفيات إيكول بتركيا لإجراء جراحة تجميل الأنف بالموجات فوق الصوتية. And we will be dealing with that, like I just okay. told you. In your acceptance speech last year, you promised a new Malawi, and you said, "I challenge those who sit in Parliament to act professionally, to set a good example. The time of giving free handouts is past." Is the appointment of your daughter Violet as a diplomat to Brussels a good example? I am really amazed that you could use that as an example of something that's not even true. Violet is not going to uh, Brussels. And so the sources... She, if, so yours, is it not true that she's third secretary at the she, mission in Belgium? She's not going to uh, as, uh, as a third secretary at the mission in Belgium. Check your facts. Investigate those things. Okay. Is it true that on this delegation to London, which is actually a virtual conference, which you'll hear, as I understand it, paid for by the British government, you have 10 people, you wanted 61 to come, r reportedly. It was reduced to 10, and of those 10, you've included in the 10 your wife, your daughter, and your son-in-law. Everyone has a responsibility, like you just mentioned. It is not that I have included them. They are part, because I brought my wife, and I did not invite myself, by the way, to this conference. I have done conferences in Malawi virtually, and over 10 of them. This was an appeal to me to be present here personally in order that we might deal with certain things. As the things. president yes. of the country, your foreign minister is back at home, and in the delegation, you've brought your family. No, I didn't. And you, and no, 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 don't, don't even use that. I brought Malawians that are doing something along with me 
on this trip and they're just as valuable. Okay, so of what, of the 10 people in the delegation, four, the, there's three of them apart from you are members of your family. And that's acceptable, is it? For, and I say this for somebody who a year ago accused the government, got into power on promising to clear the rubble of... I can tell you, each one of those have specific functions. And the specific functions are such that for me to be able to attend a meeting like this, I need their services. If there is a foreign trip for the president, the Democratic Progressive Party, your, your, the opposition, will flood his entourage with dozens of cash-hungry handclappers because it's a chance for someone to steal from Malawians. If there's a vacancy at a foreign embassy that requires a professional and career diplomat, the DPP will send someone unqualified whose only credential is being related to someone at State House by tribe or blood because it is a chance for someone to steal from Malawians. I'm quoting your words. Are you talking about qualification or not? What I said, the president in Malawi, Lazo Sequera, appoints ambassadors and their deputies. The foreign office, which I do not have any uh, influence over, they go through processes of appointing people that will serve those others as support staff. And I want you to know, because I want to grow strong institutions and I want to be able to have ministries and departments and agencies operate with minimal interference from a president, those processes are being followed. So can I ask you just finally and briefly, are you proud of your first year in power? Have you made Malawi a better country? I am extremely thankful for Malawians. Because of their choices, we have now laid a foundation in which we'll be able to truly, like we have uh, said uh, when we launched our Vision 2063, we'll be able to truly industrialize that country, be able to bring poverty uh, out of the way so we have a middle-income country, and be able to look forward to a multiplicity of jobs because of creating inclusive wealth. And that is going to be within the context of peace. That foundation has been laid. With a population that ha is hunger free, we are already onto that. With that infrastructure development, we are That's already right. onto that. That's and right. these are the plans that now are taking off even as we speak. Lazarus Chakwera, thank you for coming on Hard Talk. I am so privileged. Thank you.